Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Memo Nguye. I'm the Managing Consultant for Industrial Psychology Consultants. We are co-hosting this particular webinar with uh, Arthur Marara. Our, we collaborate with Arthur on a number of issues. Um, and we do hope that this session will help all of us uh, to understand the, the Labor Amendment Bill. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important for every HR professional to be able to, to have a feel of what is coming and what they need to be aware of, uh, so that you, have, you prepare, even as you brief your own internal executives. I think it's important to understand what is coming and what should what this these changes do tend to bring a bit of risk. And we think that uh, you must be able then to to, to make sure that uh, you you speak confidently about the issues related to the amend uh, the labor amendment bill. Uh, and to today, I have got Ata Marara, who is going with a lawyer. The author is also an author, an attorney, a business speaker. If you can have all the people on meet, uh, that would help a lot. Uh, uh, uh. So, so yeah. So 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 we 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 we. we we expect that everyone will uh, be able to make sure that there is no background noise coming from the side so that we can all pay attention. Uh, so I was introducing Arthur that he's a lawyer, he's also an author and a trainer on human capital issues and a business speaker, a law lecturer, a consultant. Uh, so we need to uh, uh, welcome uh, Arthur. Arthur, welcome uh, to, to this session. We do have, uh, initially we had uh, 466 people registered. We do hope that they will, go, they will join the, the meeting. Yeah, so uh, I think you can start. Arthur? Uh, you may be muted, I think. Yeah? But I can hear meet Arthur. But I... Can you unmute Arthur, please? Yes, uh, I asked to unmute. I know he's still muted. Can you you can you can unmute him as well? Okay. Arthur. You still uh, he's, you are still muted. If you can unmute yourself, Fadai. Fadzai? Yes, sir. If I'm yeah, trying to unmute. Um, I think I'm having issues with my laptop, but I, I'm working on it. Okay, can I? Okay. Yeah, I'm failing to unmute him on my end if he could try on his side. Uh, for which one? For Mr. Nagara. Okay, and on Sunday, I'm in a meeting. Let me call you soon after. Okay, Arthur, are you able to? Arthur? I can't see him now. Pat, eh? Yeah, I think he left the, the meeting. Uh, let's try to bring him in. Let me call him. Okay. All right, I'm back now. Something I think was... Uh... Yeah, yeah. I think after you can proceed, we've already done the introductions. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm going to go straight into the presentation. Uh, kindly enable me to have uh, my hosting, my co-hosting privileges so that okay. I'm able to share the screen. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah okay. Uh, th that is done. I think in, you should be able to do it now. All right. So thank you so much for that. I'm sorry for, for the technical glitch. So I think Kuma Memory presented why it's very important for us to be aware 
of uh, the challenges that happen in terms of the changes in terms of our law. I think it's very important for HR practitioners to be very aware of the developments that are taking place in terms of our labor law landscape. And I think one of the things that we need to pay attention to is um, the current proposition of, of uh, amending the Labor Act. The Labor Act has gone through quite a number of uh, amendments. We're going to do that later on when we'll be running a Labor Law Masterclass so that we can just have an appreciation of where we're coming from and where we're going. So right now, this proposed amendment is very, very important because it's bringing in a raft of changes. And I think it's very important, especially for HR practitioners, business leaders as well, to be aware of these particular changes. So what I've done today, I'm not going to be able to cover with you everything that is proposed in terms of the Labor Amendment Bill. I'm just going to be taking you through some, some key provisions that I think you've noticed from, uh, from the slide there that we're talking about understanding some key provisions because there are quite a number of changes. But I would like us to really also understand in terms of objectives, why are they talking about this particular amendment? So there is a perspective of Section 65 of the Constitution, and I think none of us, we are aware of Section 65 that provides for labor rights. The focus is saying, how do we get to align the Labor Act with the key provisions of Section 65 that provides for labor rights? So now this amendment is an attempt to provide that alignment with the Constitution, but also there is need to align it as well with uh, international labor uh, conventions that have been crafted over a period of time. I think one of the things that you'll note is that Zimbabwe is a signatory to quite a number of international labor organization conventions. However, in terms of our law, those don't automatically bind until they've been domesticated. So how they are bind is, yes, we've signed. The next step is we have to take those particular provisions and now domesticate them by making provision in terms of our own local legislation. So this is one of the key objectives that the draft amendment is seeking to achieve. And I think it's very important for us to be able to be aware of that. So one of the things that the, the, the bill is seeking to do is actually to expand on the rights with the focus being on fair and safe labor practices. So a number of times there was focus on unfair labor practices, but there was no focus on safe labor practice. So focus now is on safe and fair labor practices and the labor standards, which are supposed to be captured in terms of uh, the Labor Act. So one of the things that we find is there is uh, so much talk about the ease of doing business. I think this has been a buzz phrase for some time where investors are saying it's not really, really easy to do business in Zimbabwe. So one of the key considerations when people are looking at investing in an economy, they want to look at the judicial system. How easy is it to get remedy if you run into problem? Because you want to protect your investment. So they're so keen also on knowing what is the state in terms of legislation when it comes to labor matters. So the legislation as it stood, and this is what the lawmakers are saying, was really not in the interest of doing business. The ease of doing business was not actually there. So the, the idea now is to provide greater clarity and also to provide swiftness in terms of how we deal with employment disputes. So a number of times you notice that many businesses would actually have to part with a lot of money simply for them to be able to part ways with an employee. So from an ease of doing business perspective, that's not necessarily um, quite easy. And also one of the things that we notice is where there is no clarity when it comes to how do you get to interact with employees? What are their rights? And how do you part ways with an employee? That becomes a very untidy situation. So now the focus is how can we promote ease of doing business? So now the, the amendment is coming through to provide some, some provisions on issues to do with termination of contracts and uh, the processes that are also involved and a greater focus on dispute resolution and retrenchment process. And I think you will notice that one of, uh, one of the areas that has been quite a headache over a period of time was the area of retrenchment. Because at first, it was a very, very elongated process. Now, with the amendment which gave the current rise to the current legislation, uh, the process was relaxed a bit with uh, now provision for a minimum retrenchment package. But later on, you actually see that the amendment is also making some additional 
uh, provisions when it comes to the process of retrenchment. But this is all in a bit to say, how can we improve the ease of doing business? So when you're interpreting labor legislation, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is we always need to pay attention to why that amendment was contemplated. Why did they ever think about an amendment? That also reflects the spirit of the lawmaker. So when we're now interpreting the law, we want to be able to interpret it in the context of why they decided to say we want this particular type of legislation. It does help in terms of putting perspective what the Labor Act provides, which is a, a purposive rule of interpretation of the Act. In other words, we need to interpret the Labor Act in a way that best brings out its intention, which is something that we find in terms of uh, Section 2 of the Labor Act as well. So uh, I want us to be able to have clarity when it comes to that. So one of the things that we find with the bill is it's looking at some of the emerging issues uh, in the world of labor. And one of the things that we find in the emerging world of labor, some of the areas are issues to do with labor broking. So labor broking will result in triangulation. So a number of employers don't want liabilities. What do they do? They throw in a third party who does employ the people. So this was a way of running away from liability. Now, the labor aid is coming in and dealing with this aspect of uh, labor broking. So what do we do with labor broking? So one of the things that we find uh, in terms of labor broking is the act is now putting an obligation on both the employer and the labor broker. So if there are any unfair labor practices, even if you're a broker, uh, you're also liable. And even if you're using people that have been brokered to you, you're also liable. So these are some of the things that we find that are happening uh, when it comes to, to, to the amendment because it's coming from a context. And as I've promised, I'm not going to be dealing with everything. I'm just going to be picking some areas that I think are key. And some obviously will have to, to read on our own to have a better appreciation and an understanding. So I'm just going to be going through with you on some key highlights some key allies of the Labour Amendment Bill. And one of the things that I still think we, we still have a lot of room for, for improvement even uh, after this proposed bill, because I still see uh, the Labour Court has not yet been reformed to be a court that can enforce its own judgments. For some, some reasons, I don't know why up to now, when you have got an order of the court or from the Labour Court, you actually have to go to a magistrate's court in order for you to get to enforce a decision of the Labour Court, which to me doesn't make sense because a Labour Court is actually superior to a Magistrates Court. However, for purposes of enforcement of the judgment, you find that the Magistrates Court, which is not superior court, is now being given the power to actually uh, register. And I want you to notice one thing, the Magistrates Court can actually decline to register an order of uh, the Labour Court because it also has this reason. It's not merely a clerical function, it's actually a judicial function in as much as it's also administrative. So some of the things that I think we still need to inter interrogate with the lawmakers uh, on why we can actually come up with a Labour Court that is self-sufficient in terms of uh, enforcing its own judgments. So I'm going to start with clause number four. It's not yet a section. So it's clause number four. So I want us to, to have an understanding of what it deals with. So clause number four, it's uh, dealing with the issue that had been problematic for a long period of time, which was the issue of discrimination. So now what it is doing is placing an obligation, it's already there, but it's now emphasizing this particular point by placing an obligation on employers to pay male and female employees equally for work of the same value. And I think it's very important to notice that historically, men and women were not paid the same. So one of the things that I notice is that uh, the reason why we get to see more and more uh, changes is because it's also coming from in a very inequitable past. So now the lawmakers are now trying to say, how do we consolidate and close this particular gap? And now this is where you find um, the issue of equal pay coming through. Um, by clause number four, by broadening the concept because of the harsh realities of gender discrimination at the workplace. So this is one of the things that I think is quite um, phenomenal and an entrenchment of the fight against discrimination. So this is what you find in terms of uh, clause number four. And I think later on, you're also going to be seeing that there are some changes that have come through from a maternity perspective. And I think you'll see these things these are things that have been affecting women over a period of time. So also going to be looking at that and some of the victories that I think have been won as well 
in that particular aspect. So clause number four, I think is quite an interesting clause uh, in terms of engendering and entrenching the importance of equal work and equal pay. So let's go to the next area. Uh, the next area will be the issues to do with uh, the issues to do with termination of notice, and I think this has quite been a, a topical area. And up to now, I, I think the amendment that was done in 2015 did not really uh, do justice in terms of dealing with this aspect of termination of notice. What it simply did is it actually left room for termination on, on notice. So if you read through the current legislation, you can still terminate on notice. Um, and one of the things that we notice is that you can actually terminate on notice contracts that are fixed term in nature. So you can actually give a notice because the act still makes room for that. So I want you to, to, to be able to now to see um, the various changes that are coming through uh, through this particular bill. So let's look at uh, clause number eight. So what, what this does is it brings amendment to section number 12. And what it does is to unambiguously deal with the issue of common law practice of terminating the national notice. So the last time that we did um, this particular Zoom, we introduced the concept of dealing with contracts of employment, the sources of law. And I think this is one thing that we need to all be uh, alert to. Where do we get our law from? This is important because common law is one of the fundamental sources of law. And one thing that you notice when you're dealing with common law is it has evolved over a period of time. And a number of times it's now called judgment law. That's one of the terms that it's been given. So, so this common law practice is what regulated the relationship between an employer and the employee. Back then, it actually used to be master and servant. So with the master and servant regime, it's not, it was not making, uh, uh, making scope really for, for, for all these rights that we know today. And because of that, you find that the master and servant regime, it was really premised on slavery. So in a number of common law principles, they have still survived. And one of the common law practices is the one of termination or notice. So in terms of the common law, an employer was empowered and is empowered in terms of the common law to actually terminate a contract. And the only requirement is you are supposed to give notice and the notice has to be sufficient. So what do you notice that in terms of section 12 of uh, the act uh, is it was simply now providing for, for the termination periods, notice periods, if an employer wants to terminate or notice with the substantive power and right to terminate the contract being found in terms of common law. This is the, the, the Chichigao Secret Judgment in Don Yamande, where an argument has been advanced that the act does not provide for the power to terminate or notice. And the court says, yes, you're right, it doesn't. What the act simply does is to regulate the termination periods. And it does that because the power is being derived in terms of common law. So what you notice is that the legislature had run because the number of people had been fired during that period. So they'd run and say, no employer shall terminate on contract notice unless. So now there is still room for termination notice. So now section 12 is coming through to say, let's deal with this thing unambiguously. So how does it get to deal uh, with that? It's now making provisions. And we're going to look at some of the provisos on, uh, on termination notice. And one of the things that we find as well with uh, the issue of termination or notice is the issue of casualization of labor, casualization of labor. So what, one thing that we find with casualization is, uh, is the argument that had been raised in, uh, in Kuneva Kodora versus K International, where the employees were challenging the repeated renewal of the contracts. And the argument is that by repeating it, repeatedly renewing the contracts, they somehow uh, become permanent contracts. Of course, that argument was actually rejected. And the, the, the argument was rejected on the basis that a fixed term contract is a recognized type of contract. And because the fixed term contract is a recognized type of contract, in that particular context, the Supreme Court held that there was nothing amiss uh, with the fixed term contract. And I want you to read that judgment. It emphasizes the fundamental principle of sanctity of contract. So when you understand the concept of sanctity of contract, it simply means you cannot run away from the consequences of the contract that you freely and voluntarily entered into. But this is the principle that was em emphasized. So the casualization argument fell away. But now what's happening with um, clause eight, it's now interfering with a fixed term contract. 
by making a specific provision that a fixed term contract cannot be for a period of less than 12 months. And I want you to get this. So if you are giving someone a contract that is fixed, the requirement in terms of the law is that that particular contract has to be of period of 12 months. So if you give your employee a contract that is not 12 months, that is fixed, pretty much that employee by virtue of clause number eight is deemed to be a permanent employee. And I want us to bear that in mind. So remember the conversation today is what are the key amendments and what are the implications for business? And I think it's something that we need to understand when we're now crafting our contract that you can't give a contract that is below 12 months. So the effect of giving a contract that is below 12 months is in essence and in effect, pretty much giving someone a permanent contract. So they're as good as permanent, which is why it's very important for us to be very clear in terms of how we're crafting our contracts because this can actually become a source of um, strife and disputes. And I want you to notice one thing, the contract of employment, regardless of whatever you write, there is always a clause that is added by the law. So the clause that is added by law, these are the implied terms. They are implied by statute, alternatively they're implied by, by common law. So even if you don't specifically provide that the contract is going to be for 12 months. So in terms of the law, what it means is that particular contract is now permanent. This is what the, the, the proposed amendment is talking about. So the exception to this 12 month rule is unless if the employment for seasonal or casual work or for the performance of the specific service. Because the idea is how do you make someone permanent when the assignment is over? So this is some of the things that I think we need to, to have an understanding on. Uh, I've seen a hand that has been raised in Copa member. I don't know what we do. Should we finish the presentation? Then we can engage in terms yeah, of uh, we'll the presentation. Then we can open for questions. No, thank you so much for that. So um, I, I just want you to, to note your question then. Who interact on that. So those who don't have the bill, the, the, the Labor Amendment bill, um, I hope you've signed up for Mkoma Memories mailing list. I will be happy to share it with you so that you can also go through it and you can also be notified of the next trainings that will be running. And just a word of, um, uh, of update, we'll be running a masterclass on Labor Matters. This is going to be for HR practitioners. We, we hope this masterclass is going to help you to have a better understanding uh, of uh, the area of labor because we've noticed quite a number of problems that are arising uh, because of people not fully understanding and appreciating this particular area. So we'll be sharing later on and via email the particular details as to how you can also be part and pass, parcel of the masterclass where you also get to learn this thing. So uh, I think we have stressed on the issue of casualization. And, and I want you to notice one thing, there are actually statutory instruments in place right now that have already operationalized section 12 is amended by the 2015 amendment. So now several NECs have already stepped in and have said if an employee has waited for a continuous period of X amount uh, of either months or years, uh, they are now deemed to be permanent employees. So what this amendment is now doing is saying, if you are giving someone a, a fixed term contract, you have to realize that it can, on, it can be below 12 months. So the idea is to ensure that there is greater job security and also greater planning for the employee, but also think it also allows planning on the parts of the employer. What it means, if you have employees for, for this period of 12 months, um, that, that period, and thereafter they are now permanent, it actually means if you are looking at termination, you have to terminate using the established rules of termination of contract. Now you have to look at other forms of termination. Obviously, you need to look at the underlying reasons why you want to terminate that particular contract. So let's continue with clause number eight. So clause number eight is also very interesting. Eh? Remember in the Zua judgment, Don Yamande case, uh, what happened was um, a, a number of employees ended up being terminated en masse. One employer terminating 200 employees, 300 employees. I know of one employer who laid off 400 employees on notice. So I, I want you to understand what's happening. Uh, can we kindly mute our microphones, everyone, please? Uh, let's look into our microphones, ensure that it's muted so that we don't interrupt uh, this conversation. So uh, when, when you look at what happened after the SWA judgment is many employees ended up terminating employees en mass. And when the employees were terminated in mass, one of the things that you noticed was um, they, they would just be given three months and that's it. 
Uh, so a number of them would be waiting on a pension. And for some who were covered by NECs that provided for gratuity, uh, usually you, that's when you'd find that they would also get some gratuity. But in many instances, many employees went home empty-handed, which is what uh, prompted the, 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 the amendment to the Labor Act with a retrospective effect because of the negative effects that had been caused by the Don Yamande judgment. So what you find with the amendment here now is that uh, the Act is now saying if you are, want to terminate the majority of your employees, in fact, if you are actually employing quite a number of people and you want to terminate them, you have to go through retrenchment. That's one of the things that I want to notice. So you, you can't just give, say, uh, notice to say your, your contract is terminating simply because uh, you are on a fixed term contract. Now the law is saying, even if you can terminate those contracts or notice, you can't terminate them on notice. You have to proceed through the medium and the instrumentality of retrenchment. And I want you to notice that. So now this is a fundamental change. So the majority of the terminations in one way or the other, they are now going to, to be having a retrenchment component, especially if notice is involved. We're going to look at that uh, later on in these slides. So that will be clause number, number eight. I hope you're still following that. Uh, so that we don't get lost. And then let's look at uh, the other aspect, which is uh, again provided for in terms of uh, clause number eight. So clause number eight is now providing as well for termination of contracts for breach of express or implied conditions of service after due process. So I want you to look at this. I, I don't know for, for whatever reason why, the, the lawmaker at this close, for me, I really think it was not necessary because when an employer is alleging termination of, of, uh, of contract on the basis of breach of an express or implied conditions, in essence, what the employer is referring to is the provisions of SI 15 of 2006, which is codifying the common law. And the offense is usually section 4A, which is a uh, breach of uh, that particular clause, which imposes an obligation for an employee not to engage in any act or conduct that is inconsistent with the fulfillment of the express or in implied conditions. So this particular clause, which has been introduced, is simply pointing us towards a disciplinary hearing. So what is meant by due process? It means we're in essence going through a disciplinary hearing. So what it simply means, um, you need to go through the process of section 12B which imposes an obligation on the employer not to unfairly dismiss an employee. And remember what Section 12B says, an employee is deemed to be unfairly dismissed if the employer fails to demonstrate that the termination was in terms of an industrial court or in terms of SI 15 of 2006. So I, I want you to, to notice that um, the law, it's now making more of an emphasis on on this particular process that we still need to conduct a hearing, even if you are alleging that an employee in person has committed an act of conduct which is inconsistent with the fulfillment of the express or implied conditions of employment. So I want to notice one thing from section 12. Section 12 is now codifying how an employee can terminate a contract. So when you read it, it's now saying an employee can terminate a contract through resignation. That's what it says. Then for an employer, it's now specifying how an employer can actually terminate a contract. So what, what, what it's simply doing now is saying, we want to try to, to keep the issue of termination notice. That, that's what the employer, is. The, the law is trying to do in this particular instance in order to provide for uh, more clarity and more certainty in terms of uh, how the contracts are actually terminated. Then let's go to clause number nine. So clause number nine, in essence, has been replaced. It is replaced uh, Section 12C in totality. That's what's happening with clause number nine of the bill. So Section 12C has now been rewritten. So the procedure then was you give notice, once you give notice to either the retrenched board, Wakes Council, or NEC. Now the process has been changed completely. Now, if you look into clause number nine, there are also some fundamental definitions that have been contained there uh, in terms of that particular clause. So you also see that the term capacity to pay is now being defined 
the term employer has now been defined. And what you notice as well is a, a trust in, is being defined as an employer in terms of uh, uh, clause number nine of the bill. In terms of the law, a trust is not a legal person. But in terms of the bill, the trust is being recognized as an employer, which implies it's some pseudo type of person which has got the capacity to actually sue and to be sued. So now questions will arise. Can you actually sue a trust in light of the fact that the law is saying uh, the trust is an employer? So one of the things that we find which has been quite topical is the issue of trust schools. How do you deal with trust schools? And how do you cite a trust to the proceedings? So in terms of the law, a trust proceedings uh, against a trust uh, would have been should, issued or initiated against the trustees. Now the act is coming and saying an employer is a trust, whether domiciled in Zimbabwe, in other words, whether they're actually operating in Zim or they're domiciled outside Zimbabwe. So the focus really is on how do we enforce the judgment, which is a question of jurisdiction. But in terms of that particular amendment, there is provision of the fact that the question of domicile is not really an issue. So whether or not they're actually domiciled in Zimbabwe, these guys can actually be sued and these guys can actually be viewed as an employer for purposes of retrenchment. So look at the essential definitions which are actually provided in terms of that uh, proxy of uh, the, the bill, quite some interesting uh, the definitions that you find there as well. So it also entrenches the obligation of an employer to pay a retrenchment package to his employee. Um, so the idea now is a number of employers would actually make it very difficult for employees to get their package. So some would conduct themselves in their business in a way that would actually make it very, very impossible for the employees to, to, to get their packages. So now the law is saying if an employer conducts his affairs in a way that diminishes their capacity, that fact is not going to relieve him or relieve it from paying the retrenchment package. No, so now the law is saying we have an interest in running the affairs of this um, business in the run-up to uh, the retrenchment. So it's going to look into that. And one of the things that we find as well is the question of the minimum retrenchment package. It's, it's also being um, visited as well. Remember the concept of a minimum retrenchment package. Currently, as the regime stands, is providing for one month salary for every two years' wait. That's the, that's the current regime. One month salary for every two years' wait. But the, the, the proposed amendment is introducing something uh, called an enhanced package. In other words, certain employers would simply um, take advantage of the fact that there is um, a minimum package. So what do they do? They would say, come, we are proposing to retrench you. So this is what we're proposing as well is our minimum retrench package. And guess what? If you start with these guys from a minimum package, you are best guaranteed that the package is never going to go up. Then the employer would simply say, we've engaged, we've disguised, we failed to agree. And because we failed to agree, the employer simply say, uh, now we're paying you the minimum retrenchment package. So a number of times, even the organization that had capacity to actually pay more would simply say, we failed to agree, we discussed, we negotiated, tried to move from the minimum package. And guess what? They would actually say, we've tried our best, we've done our best, and that is it. So now the act and the law is coming out with a proposal that if the employees can actually demonstrate that this employer is got a capacity to be a better retrenchment package, they should actually be able to make representations to the retrenchment board to that effect. And that employer who makes an allegation that they, they don't have the capacity to actually meet that, an obligation is also now being placed for them to apply to the retrenchment board and to make full disclosure by full disclosure, that means you now need to bring your books. You now need to bring your, your bank statements so that we can actually know that you don't have money. And I know many businesses do not really want that. But the whole idea is for greater transparency in terms of the process of retrenchment in order to ensure that the employees are not left dry or empty-handed. And I think it's quite a, quite a very key provision which most employers need to have uh, an understanding of because it has serious replications and serious effects to the organization. So one of the things that I find as well is that um, the, the act, the draft amendment to the act is also making provision for enforcement 
of retrenchment package. So if you don't pay, now that package is deemed to be a liquid document. By liquid document, this is the document that we take to a high court ordinarily. If it's a liquid document, you take it to the high court, you apply for what is called provisional sentence, the entire judgment. So now a, a, a retrenchment package is now being deemed as as a liquid document. And what it means if it's a liquid document, you are now entitled to approach the labor court for registration of that particular order so that it can be treated as an order of court. And once the labor court is registered that particular order, the next thing that we find is it's going to be enforced through the either the magistrate's court, depending of course, with the monetary jurisdiction or with the high court, again, depending with the, the monetary jurisdiction of uh, uh, by court is not bound really by, by monetary jurisdiction. So it's monetary jurisdiction in respect of the master's court. Then if it's higher than the master's court, you go to the high court, which is unlimited jurisdiction. That would be the correct position of the law. So now a retrenchment package is capable of being enforced. So you don't necessarily have to go through uh, the designated agent. You don't have to go through the labor officer. Now you can go straight to the labor court. That is uh, the introduction that we find. So clause number 10. So it's, um, it's meant to cure scenarios whereby employers conduct themselves in a fraudulent manner and reckless manner uh, in their conduct of the business in order to avoid payment of such uh, package. So the whole idea is there has to be someone responsible so that the employees are not left in the dry and left uh, to, to, to literally starve. So the law is saying we're coming through to do with this particular aspect. So I think it's quite a very important provision as well, uh, which is very important. And I think I, I also made highlights to, to this particular point, which are seen there on, uh, on clause number 11, which is dealing with uh, issues to do with the maternity leave. That's one of the things that I find. So pretty much clause number 11, I mean section 18 of the Labor Act to align with section 65, subsection seven of the constitution, uh, to ensure that women employees have the right to fully paid maternity leave for a period of three months. So what it's simply doing is removing the qualifying periods. So qualifying periods, you're simply saying, um, if, if, any, if a woman has not yet served an employer for a period of a year, you can't actually go on maternity. So what would happen in, in such instances is in many employers would avoid employing a pregnant woman because it means that if she's pregnant, and she reaches the time to, to give birth, ordinarily should actually require leave. So a number of employers would run away from that. So consequently, you find that many women were being discriminated on the basis of pregnancy. So now the idea is to say, we're now going to remove the qualifying uh, requirements and we're going to ensure that you have got three months maternity. So one of the things that we find as well that is being removed is the issue of the number of times a woman can go on maternity leave. So the last time you'd actually limit, you can't go for a certain number of times for maternity. So in essence, you're actually being told the number of children to have, which to me, I think is a serious infringement on, on your rights to privacy, rights to your health, do whatever you want. So the, the idea now is to say, women should also enjoy greater protection in terms of their maternity rights. But I also think in a way, it's also a victory for men in the instance that you also want to, to have a growth in your family. So it means your wife is capable of going on uh, maternity. Uh, and I want you to notice one thing, that um, uh, the, the period that I was being stated is under one employer. So you couldn't go for three times on maternity under one employer, one employer. So what in essence, you're actually being limited to just having three babies, which to me, I think, will not actually come out very well. And then the other aspect that we find in terms of the amendment is the question of zero hour contracts. So pretty much um, this, is, um, this is a section that has uh, been made, you know, the main provision for the manner in which an employer can engage employees on, on contracts for hourly work against the backdrop of uh, new forms of contracts called zero hour contracts. And under these contracts, workers are only paid for the actual hours worked in the event of work stoppage and not caused by the employee. 
So this is also one of the things that um, you find. But the law is saying if you employ employees in such a setup, you don't have to prohibit them from seeking other work. Remember, in terms of the common law, an employee, once he's employed, he cannot work for another person. But now the act is coming in and saying, no, if you're actually employing employees in this particular type uh, of uh, setup, you have to recognize the fact that they uh, can also seek other, other employment from elsewhere. So one of the things that we find as well is uh, this particular section or clause is also mandating the employer to pay up the difference of what the employees earn and the minimum wage where employees do not earn the minimum wage for a period of two months. Once again, it's also an attempt to say, how do we improve uh, the conditions of the employees as well? Then on clause number 12, uh, one of the things that we find is it's now dealing with the issue of brokerage. I think we talked about that in the introductory phase on broking. So if you're in a brokerage arrangement, it is coming through to afford protection for employees in such arrangements by making the labor broker and the employer, and this is very important, the labor broker and the employer are going to be both liable to the employee. So if I'm suing you, I'm going to sue you both as a broker and the employer. You're going to be both liable. So this was a way of uh, running away from, uh, from obligation by creating these triangulated uh, employment relationships with uh, the focus on circumventing employer obligations and responsibility, including fair remuneration of workers. So now the, the mission that they're trying to deal with is that particular aspect. Then CBAs, a uh, very interesting area of law, uh, which I think um, is quite key for many organizations because many organizations, they're actually part of NECs, whether voluntary, whether statutory. And uh, there's also some, some changes which are coming through as well in terms of very same amendment, which is dealing with uh, the aspects to do with statutory uh, NECs. So, but this particular NEC is making a minister a party to a collective bargaining agreement where statutory bodies or entities controlled by the state are parties to a collective bargaining agreement. And this is very important because the state is in many, many of these entities, and these are commonly called parastatals. So many parastatals, um, they are governed by um, the, the Labor Act. So what would happen in the ordinary course of things is the parties would just go, enter into a collective bargaining agreement, and the next thing, the, the entity is actually bound, regardless of the fact that it's owned by the state. So now the minister becomes a party to this particular CBA. And why? Because the state is now interested in being able to monitor the, the costs of employment uh, that are being agreed upon by the party. So, so the minister is coming through as a balancing force. This, this is the reason why um, with the current regime of uh, collective bargaining legislation, the minister is ultimately empowered to register or decline to register a collective bargaining agreement. That's why if you read in terms of section 79 of uh, the Labor Act, section 79, section 80, section 801, there is a process that is involved in terms of getting to actually register a collective bargaining agreement. And secondly, you also notice that a collective bargaining agreement is not binding until it has been registered, until it has been published as well. So it only becomes binding from the day that it's been published. In other words, it's now become a statutory instrument. Otherwise, it's not binding. So I usually see quite a number of people trying to enforce um, and raise the collective bargaining agreements. You can, but uh, if you meet someone who is uh, a bit smart, they're actually going to raise a point, and it's a valid point in terms of the law because a collective bargaining agreement only becomes binding only once it has been registered. Yeah, so the other aspect that we find is always close number 17, which is something to do with trade unions. So a number of organizations, because you employ quite a number of people, uh, you find that your employees are part of trade unions, which is a constitutional right. It's also guaranteed as well in terms of the Labor Act. So now, because many people are uh, entrepreneurs in a way, they realize that you can also make money through trade unions. And how do you do that? You simply register and you start collecting um, your trade union dues. So now one of the things that I've been finding is there were quite a number of briefcase trade unions. So briefcase trade unions, these are unions that just exist in the briefcases. Uh, no, no, no fixed abode whatsoever. 
So now there's now a requirement for, for trade unions on registration to actually provide a physical head office of the organization and submission of the minutes uh, of the meeting of the organization. So the whole idea is we also need a clarity and certainty as to who are we dealing with in terms of uh, the trade union. So it becomes a very important uh, observation and addition in order for employers as well to be protected in terms of who do they deal with. Also, I think it's also important for, for the employees to be protected as well in terms of the particular trade unions that they deal with. Then you'll find that there is uh, clause number 25, which is uh, on uh, dispute resolution. So pretty much section um, clause number 25, it's amending section 63 of the existing act in order to ensure that the matters of dispute or unfair labor practice are addressed by allowing a labor officer to assume jurisdiction over such matters where they've not been attended to by a designated agent within a period of 30 days. So this allows for access to justice to concerned parties in places where there are no designated agents of the National Employment Councils and in situations of inordinate delays by the NEC. So the NEC loses jurisdiction if they fail to dispose of a matter within 30 days, meaning if you're an employer, if you're an employee, you can actually say, I'm taking my case, I'm going with it to the Labor Officer on the authority of the amended Section 63 of uh, the Labor Act. And I want you to, to be mindful of the word that has been used today in terms of Section 63, which is redress. And that is a term that was dealt with by the Chief Justice in the case of ISOQUANT investments. ISOQUANT trading is MOCO versus Memory Dariqua. The concept of redressing was actually dealt with by the Chief Justice in terms of uh, unpacking dispute resolution in Zimbabwe under the new dispensation. So that has been brief. Uh, some of the key highlights, of course, I won't be able to finish all of them because they're quite detailed. So those are my numbers if you want to reach out to me and also my email address that's also there below. And I noticed that quite a number of people have been raising their hands. At this stage, of my memory, um, I would want... Yeah, we, thank, 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 mm -hmm. thank you, Arthur. We, we can take questions. Uh, I will allow, if you've got any questions, uh, please... Um, Maybe let me start with the questions in the chat uh, and see. Uh, uh, someone says, instead of termination of fixed term contracts following the cumbersome retirement process, why not put a clause that says, on termination of any fixed term contract, an employee on a fixed term contract, terminal benefits shall be calculated in terms of similar to those open ended contracts without the need to follow retirement administrative position. I think this is just a suggestion. Uh, probably yeah, not it, a it, it, it is, it is, it is a suggestion. Okay. Yeah, let's get let's get questions. What does close eight uh, to what does close eight to the end? Joseph Chaway contracts are fixed term uh, period. I think the person is uh, asking. You talked about uh, the issue of uh, bringing in whether if you are terminating a group of employees, they want yeah. fi uh, who yeah. fixed term contract. You have to go the retrenchment route. Yeah, yeah, uh, what yeah. happens to what, what is the implication for the NGO sector? That largely depends on. Uh, a short term funding uh, and uh, so which means they have to go through the retrenchment route is that correct indeed they actually have to go through that retrenchment route so so there are actually many reasons why employers would put employees on a fixed term contract but mm -hmm. there is also the reality of abuse of mm -hmm. uh, of all concepts so right now the reality is you still have to go through the retrenchment process in which case you will have to go through and make those representations okay no that's fine thank you um uh, uh, I don't have any other questions in the chat. Uh, can I open this to anyone with a question uh, directly to, to Arthur? Any questions? Yeah, it seems that there are no questions, Arthur. Uh, which means it was clear uh, what you what you what you said. So what we do is we have recorded this. We will be able to share the recording with uh, the participants. You know what happened is we we didn't realize that our account had a limit of a thousand of a hundred, but we had ah. over three hundred fifty six people registered. So very unfortunate wow. situation. We are actually upgrading that account. I didn't know it was at the limit of a hundred. Oh, no. So we we are actually upgrading. Yeah. So what I may suggest after is that uh, why not uh, run another one? Uh, we, we are updating the account immediately after this. Why not no, run no, another no. one early next week? I will discuss this offline so that we can uh, 
they run another 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 similar session as we prepare for the master class yeah no no definitely let's let's do that uh, and those mm -hmm. who want to be part of the master class uh ensure that you're on common memories uh, mailing list we'll, yeah. mailing list yeah. yeah yeah we'll be sharing the details if you don't know the details uh he's going to be sharing with you how you can be part of that master class as well um, yeah, so yeah. Again, from, from, from innocent jenna yeah, innocent please go ahead and meet yourself and go ahead innocent Hello. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moy. I just wanted to inquire, how does the Labour Amendment deal, we deal with cases where we have, the, for example, cases before the Labour Court judgments are not forthcoming? How are those issues addressed? Because you keep on writing like to the Labour Court, you don't get a judgment. All right, so that, that is not dealt with by the Labour Court. It's real, dealt with by... Uh, there is actually a code of conduct for judges that deals with that. So right now the code of conduct says a judge cannot sit on a judgment for a period of 90 days. So if you're having any particular challenges for the labor court, you have to engage the judge president. Uh, you'll be able to get um, a remedy in, in respect of the issue that you'll be facing. But um, it's, it's something that has already been dealt with uh, by, by the Judicial Service Commission when it came up with the code of conduct for the judges. Okay. Let's have any other questions. Another question? Okay, if there are no further questions, I think, uh, thank you very much, Arthur. We Let's uh, talk behind the scenes so that we can uh, set another one uh, with a larger thank group. A, a larger thank group. Yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank right. you.